Hello, and thank you for joining me. May this video be a blessing to you and your loved ones, and may it honor and glorify God in this kingdom. This video is going to be a collection and a summary of videos I've made in the past, speaking out against Apostle Paul, showing him to be uh, a false apostle. It is my hope that I can create a one-stop, one-shot kind of video for all of the evidence against Paul, and there are mounds of it. For your convenience, I'm going to include in the description box an index so that you can simply go to the different parts of the video that deals with a particular argument. In this way, it will make it easier for you to respond either by way of comments or with a video response. And I do hope that you will do so, especially if I am in air. If you can show me that I'm in air, I want you to do so. So I encourage video responses, whether you deal with the whole video or just with parts, uh, with uh, one or two of the arguments that I'm presenting. Because if I am in error, no one wants to know about it more than me, because I understand the severe consequences that will be attached to me uh, teaching that Paul is a false apostle, if in fact he was a true apostle of Christ. If I am calling a man of God a liar, then I am going to be severely punished for it. So I do want to know, but understand that I require actual evidence of it. I require you to show me by way of scripture that I'm in error. Do not think for a moment that you will be able to argue from the heart or, or by way of emotion. For example, I'm constantly sent uh, private messages or comments telling me or suggesting that if God wanted to do it, he could do it. Well, yes, if God wanted to, he could, but that's not an argument for him actually having done it. If God wanted to, yes, he could create a book made up of 66 books that would include all of his written word and that it would be infallible and he would not allow anyone, including Satan, to corrupt it. He would not allow anyone to add or take away from it. If God wanted to, he could do this. The question is, did God want to do this? Was that his intention? And did God do it? Well, I tell you, there is no evidence whatsoever that God did this. And so don't argue that he did something simply because he could have done it if he wanted to. Now, regarding the Bible being the infallible word of God and including all of his written word. There is not one passage, not one piece of scripture that suggests this is the case. And so if you're going to tell me that the Bible is infallible and that it includes all of God's written word, then show me by way of scripture. If I'm wrong, if you can prove this to me, then I will be able to accept Paul as a true apostle. But I doubt very much that you will be able to do it. Now regarding Paul, I understand that he includes some truth in his teachings. Yes, you will be able to quote some passages that line up with the teachings of Yeshua and with the other apostles. Paul does do this. I understand this. I admit this. But it's not an issue of whether or not Paul has some truth if some of his teachings do line up with Yeshua and the other apostles. The problem is with those passages and those teachings that do not line up. The problem is with those teachings that contradict those teachings and commandments of Yeshua and the other apostles. The fact that Paul can include you know, 50% of his writings that line up with the other writers, that's irrelevant if 50% contradict and teach something entirely different. And it is those passages, it is those teachings that we need to focus on. It's not enough that he be right 50% of the time. The 50% of the time that he is wrong and that he contradicts Yeshua and the other apostles, it is those teachings that will lead people to destruction. Now, regarding the Bible, and I've talked about this in a good number of my videos, there is evidence that the Bible does not include all of God's written word. For example, in 2 Esdras, this is one of the 14 books of the Apocrypha. It tells us that there were 94 books, and this is going back prior to Yeshua coming on the scene. 
It tells us there were 94 books. 24 were for the general public, for anyone and everyone to read. But there were 70 books that were for the initiate only. And this is confirmed in a New Testament writing called the Gospel of Nicodemus, for it talks about the book that contains 70. Then in the writings of Peter, uh, non-canonical writings known as uh, Clementine's homilies, Peter explains that there are falsehoods that are placed alongside Scripture. There are falsehoods placed within Scripture. Satan is given great latitude in his ability to deceive people. And Peter makes it very plain. He, he comes right out and tells us that there are falsehoods placed within Scripture, and they are there to test us. They are there to separate those people who hear the voice of the evil shepherd and follow him. These scriptures, these falsehoods rather, are placed alongside scripture to separate the sheep from the goats. For the sheep will hear the voice, will recognize the voice of the good shepherd and will ignore and will walk away from the voice of the evil shepherd. So there is evidence that the Bible is in or is fallible and does include falsehoods in it and that the Bible does not include all of God's written word. And there are other passages as well. For example, Jude quotes Enoch. He quotes a passage from Enoch. And Yeshua also speaks about the fact that the Sadducees didn't know scripture. For he talks about marriage being in heaven and the fact that when we are in heaven, we will be as the angels and that they do not marry. Well, that's not found in the Bible, and yet Yeshua describes it as being scripture. But that is described as well in the writings of Enoch. So we have both Yeshua and Jude referring to and actually quoting from Enoch showing us that there is more to God's written word than what is found in the Bible. So if there can be books missing, if the canon process kept some of God's written word out of the Bible, then surely there could have been books added to the Bible that never should have been. And then regarding the 66 books of the Protestant Bible, and this is one of the smallest Bibles found in mainstream Christianity, 66 books. And the mark of the beast is 666. And then you look at the makeup of the Protestant Bible. We find in the Old Testament that there are three sets of 13. Three sets of 13 books. And then in the New Testament, Paul writes 13 books. So we have these sets of 13. 13, of course, being a number of the occult and of Satan. And 13 representing death. Why would God create such a book and, and then tell us it's the infallible, or his infallible word and that it includes all of his word? Why would God create a book that has connections to the number 666 and 13? I tell you, he would not. There are many red flags found in Scripture pointing to Paul being a false apostle and pointing to the Protestant Bible as not being the infallible Word of God and not including all of his written word. Now, having explained that, let's have a look at the teachings of Paul. I'd like to begin with his conversion stories, for we find three different conversion stories in the book of Acts, but then there's a fourth story found in uh, Galatians, where Peter uh, talks about the events following directly after his Damascus experience. So it's his post-Damascus experience, but it, it's still tied into his conversion. So there's actually four stories that we need to look at when looking at Paul's conversion. Now, in the first conversion story, as it's found in the book of Acts, it tells us that Paul is on the road to Damascus, and then uh, he is knocked to the ground by this blinding light, and he is surrounded by this light. There is no mention of his companions being surrounded by the light, only him. And then we are told that there is uh, this voice, and his companions heard the voice. In the second 
conversion story, it's very different. It tells us that uh, his companions heard something, but they didn't recognize it as a voice. They didn't understand what was being said. This is important because it, it shows a contradiction in the story, but it's also important when looking at who Paul is speaking to in the other two stories. For the first conversion story is really a narrative by Luke, and we have to assume that he learnt the story from Paul himself because he was a companion of Paul's. Now also in the first uh, conversion story, we are told that immediately after his conversion, Paul began preaching in Damascus. And then after a while, uh, there were those Jews who became angered with him and wanted to murder him. And so Paul had to make an escape. And then after his escape, he went to Jerusalem. So immediately after his conversion, started preaching in Damascus. Now, uh, regarding Ananias. Ananias is seen as a second witness in this first conversion story and the same thing in the second conversion story. Now, in the second conversion story, it's actually Paul himself who is speaking and he's speaking to the Jews and Jewish religious leaders. And so Paul had to stress the importance of a second witness who is supposedly Ananias. And what Paul tells us is that Ananias is also the one who had a vision from Yeshua and was given instructions to give to Paul, of which Ananias was told to tell Paul that he is going to be sent to the Gentiles. So we find that this idea of Paul going to the Gentiles was first given to this second witness who is Ananias. And Paul explains it in this fashion because he's speaking to Jewish religious leaders and he had to be able to provide a second witness uh, to the things that he was claiming. But in the third conversion story, Paul is speaking to King Agrippa and he leaves out Ananias altogether. No mention of him whatsoever. In this third conversion story, Paul is stressing everything about himself. It's all about him. In this story, no one else could understand what was being said. It, it's just him. He hears from Yeshua directly. And Yeshua tells him that he is going to be spreading the good news, or he's going to be teaching uh, both to the Jews and the Gentiles, but they are going to be angered with him, both the Jews and the Gentiles. So very different stories depending on who Paul is speaking to. And this is Paul's character, for Paul tells us that he becomes whoever he has to become when speaking to different people. Whatever the environment, whoever he's with, he changes himself. He becomes who he has to in order to appease those people. And that's what we see Paul doing. It's why he lies as he does. Then, regarding the uh, letter to the Galatians. In speaking to these Gentiles, again, it's all about Paul, and he's trying to stress this fact that Jesus taught him directly. He tells us he didn't learn from the apostles. After his conversion, he didn't seek out the apostles. He didn't go to them for teachings, but rather he went to Arabia. Well, this is very different from that first conversion story that Luke tells us. According to Paul, uh, Immediately after his conversion, he went to Arabia, and it's in Arabia where he learned from Jesus himself. He didn't have to learn from the apostles. So we are supposed to believe that Yeshua, after his resurrection, and after appearing to the disciples and other witnesses, he then ascended to heaven. But he came back down to teach Paul directly, to teach Paul one-on-one. -on -one. This is what Paul would have us believe. Everything he learned, he learned directly from Yeshua. Well, the problem with this is that Yeshua warns us that people will claim this. Yeshua tells us, if someone says they saw me in the desert or saw me in the wilderness, you should not believe them. Don't believe them. Something else most Christians don't realize is that Simon the Magician claims something very similar. We find in the Clementine homilies that Simon the Magician, who had a number of debates with Peter, 
claimed the same thing. Simon the magician claimed to have learned directly from Yeshua. And so Paul and Simon the magician have this in common, both claiming to have learned directly from Christ. Yet no one, no Christian, would say that uh, Simon the Magician is someone that you should listen to, that Simon the Magician is a true apostle. My brothers and sisters, it's important to look at these red flags. The fact that the very first place Paul went to after his conversion is the house of Judas is a red flag. Jesus and God the Father is showing us with these red flags for those people who have discernment. The fact that Paul, after his conversion, after being blinded, the first place he went to while still blind was the house of Judas. This is a warning for us. We know that when Scripture speaks about the house of anyone, it is talking about their lineage. For example, Yeshua came from the house of David. And we find in Paul's conversion story that he goes to the house of Judas. Well, yes, we know that this is not the Judas who was one of the 12 apostles, but the, the phrase, the house of Judas, is a warning to us that Paul is a false apostle. And there are many such warnings found in Scripture. And I've already spoken about some of them. The fact that Jesus warned not to believe someone if they claimed to have seen him in the desert or the wilderness. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's look at some other facts about Paul. Uh, in addition to his conversion stories, there's descriptions of false apostles and uh, false teachers that we need to look at. Yeshua has been very faithful to the elect and he's shown great wisdom in leaving identification markers in scripture to help us identify false teachers. And in regards to Paul, we find three specific identification markers to help us identify him as a false apostle. The first is in the warning that Christ gives us regarding the yeast of the Pharisees. For Paul himself tells us that he is a Pharisee among Pharisees. And this isn't just something that he considered himself prior to the conversion uh, that he went through. But he actually refers to himself still as a Pharisee late in his life and his ministry. So Paul never stops thinking of himself as a Pharisee. And Yeshua warns us about the yeast of the Pharisees. Then there's the fact that Paul is a Roman citizen. And we know that Rome is part of the beast system. Rome is one of the beasts that are spoken about in prophecy. We see this in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue and Daniel's interpretation of that dream. For we know that Rome is part of that statue and that Rome is one of the beasts. And Paul is a Roman citizen. Then there's the fact that Paul comes from the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin is known as the wolf. For the insignia of Benjamin, of that tribe, is the wolf. And just to drive this point home, I'm going to now read from a non-canonical book known as the Testament of Benjamin. And the Testament of Benjamin is one of 12 books, or 12 writings, that make up the book known as the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. And I'm going to be reading from this book here. It's titled, The Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 25. And just to explain this, uh, each of the 12 testaments is the, uh, uh, one of the 12 leaders of the tribes of Benjamin, the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, they are giving their last testament while on their deathbed to their children. And this is part of what uh, Benjamin has to say. And I shall no longer be called a ravening wolf on account of your ravages, but a worker of the Lord, distributing food to them that work what is good. So this is a prophecy from Benjamin that his tribe, his children, his descendants will be known as ravenous wolves. Well, I believe Yeshua is referring to this prophecy when he talks about wolves in sheep's clothing. It's not just a way of 
describing false teachers that they are wolves in sheep's clothing, but it's actually identifying one particular wolf coming from the tribe of Benjamin, and that person is Apostle Paul. So I don't believe it's a coincidence that Paul is identified by these three markers. He's these three things. It is Yeshua's way. It is God's way of identifying Paul as a false apostle and that his falsehoods, his false teachings have been placed alongside the true scriptures. All right, let's now have a, a closer look at Paul's explanation of where he received his revelations from. For he tells us that he received all of his revelations, all of his understanding of Yeshua and of the cross of salvation directly from Yeshua. When looking at the evidence for or against Paul, I believe it's helpful to look at those teachers that we know without question are false teachers. Now, a good example of such a person is Simon the Magician, whom I've already spoken briefly on. I'd like to look at some of the similarities between Simon and Paul. Now, I've already spoken about Paul's conversion and how his description of his conversion story and the fact that he claims to have gained all of his knowledge from Christ is similar to what Simon claims. Now, Simon claims to have received his revelation and understanding of salvation of God and of Christ from an apparition of Christ. He never walked with Christ in the flesh, and he states this, but he claims that his knowledge and his revelation is superior to that of those people who actually walked with Christ during his ministry while he walked the earth in the flesh. While well, Paul is similar to uh, Simon in that he never knew Christ while he walked the earth in the flesh. So they have this in common. Now, Paul doesn't describe Christ as ha having been an apparition that taught him. He does tell us, however, that he never uh, learned anything that he knows from the apostles. He never sought them out. Rather, he went into Arabia. And he spent several years there. Now, if it wasn't an apparition, if it wasn't Christ coming down from heaven, uh, and instead of that, he received his knowledge by way of visions and dreams, well, then it's still similar to what Simon claims. Paul really does believe that he had superior knowledge, superior revelation and understanding when it came to Christ, salvation, the law, and uh, the kingdom of God. There's no question that Paul felt that he had superior knowledge and revelation. And this is similar to what Simon claimed. Now, uh, Paul doesn't come right out and tell the apostles this. He doesn't tell those people uh, in the churches that he's writing to that he is, without question, superior to the other apostles. He does, however, make some claims that certainly alludes to this, and it leaves no question, really, that Paul believed something similar to Simon in that he was superior to that of the other apostles. Now, I understand that Paul says uh, that he is the least of the apostles, but this is false humility, and we can see this when we read the other things that Paul states. For example, Paul claims to have been picked by God, to have been chosen by God even before he was born. So according to Paul, he is a special vessel. He is a special instrument that was chosen by God even before he was born. So this is one way of asserting his authority, leaving no doubt, no question that he is someone that we should look up to, that he has special revelation and understanding. Then we have Paul referring to his message, the message that he is spreading as being his gospel. He actually uses the words, my gospel, or the phrase, my gospel, twice. So he is bragging, in a way, or stating his authority. 
when he is saying it's his gospel. Not the gospel of Christ, but his gospel. Paul also talks about tearing the law down. He actually uses the words uh, tore down. Paul claims to have tore the law down and that he would be making a huge mistake if he was to rebuild the law that he already tore down. Now, in making this claim regarding the law, there is no one else who does this. This, or I should say Paul, is the only one making this claim. So again, Paul is showing his authority, showing that he has greater revelation, teaching this new teaching regarding the law. No one else taught it, and certainly Yeshua himself never taught it. Paul also claims to have superior knowledge when it comes to understanding the food laws uh, about eating food sacrificed to idols. Now we have the apostles themselves giving Paul a letter and stating emphatically that we are not to eat food sacrificed to idols, but we find in 1 Corinthians that Paul talks about having superior knowledge when it comes to food sacrificed to idols. So once again, Paul asserting that he has been given greater revelation and understanding regarding these things than what the other apostles had. Paul instructs those people that he converts to think of him as their spiritual father. Well, this goes against the instructions of Christ. Christ is very clear. He's emphatic about this, that we are to call no man father. And he is, of course, speaking spiritually. We should not think of anyone as our spiritual father except for God the Father, our creator. But Paul comes along and tells people that they should think of him as their spiritual father. Well, this is once again Paul claiming to have a greater revelation. What he's basically saying is what Yeshua taught the apostles uh, was only for that time period and only for those apostles. But now, now that he's resurrected, he's given me this new information, new knowledge, uh, new revelation. And you should think of me as your spiritual father. And this is, of course, the reason that the Catholic Church has this tradition where priests are called father. And they think of the Pope as the Holy Father. So these lies have crept into the church because of the teachings of Paul. And it comes from his belief that he was given greater knowledge, greater revelation, or new revelation that the other apostles did not have. But worse than any of this is the fact that Paul told Philemon in his letter to Philemon that he should think of him as having saved his soul. This is what Paul actually tells Philemon. In the New Living Translation, it actually describes Paul as saying, you owe me your very soul. Well, this goes against everything that is taught in Scripture. None of the other apostles would ever make the claim that anyone owes them their very soul. And yet Paul makes that statement. And it's a condemning statement. It should leave no question, no doubt, that Paul is a false apostle. For this is exactly the kind of thing that we would expect Simon the Magician to say. Simon the magician was so full of himself, even though we don't see it in any writing that he states that people owe him. The fact is, Simon did believe this. Simon was very boastful, very prideful in this way. And making this claim that someone owes him their very soul, well, it shows that he really is a false teacher. Now there's one more point I'd like to make regarding Paul's pride and the fact that he thought he had greater authority than the other apostles. It comes in his statement that Peter was an apostle to the Jews while he, Paul, had been chosen to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Not one of many, not a apostle to the Gentiles, but the apostle to the Gentiles. This shows that Paul is a liar. And I say this because Paul was at the council in Jerusalem 
when Peter himself stated that he was, in fact, chosen to be the mouth that the Gentiles would hear the gospel from. Peter very clearly states this, that the Gentiles would hear the gospel from him. And yet we find Paul stating that Peter was an apostle to the Jews, while he was the apostle to the Gentiles. This shows, without question, if people were honest, if they would actually read the Bible with an open heart seeking the truth, if they would stop following the traditions of man, it would be obvious when Paul makes this statement that he is contradicting Peter. He is telling those people that he's writing to, hey, if there's any confusion regarding who you should believe, Believe me, because Paul, or, or because Peter was chosen for the Jews, but me, myself, I, Paul, was chosen to come to you. And so it is me that you should listen to. The idea that there are no contradictions in the Bible is a fairly recent teaching. We know this because we only need to go back to the time of Martin Luther and read his writings and we would see that Martin Luther himself believed there were contradictions in the Bible. He went so far as to say that the epistle of James was one of straw and that it should be burned. And the reason is because Martin Luther clearly understood that James taught something very different from Apostle Paul. Martin Luther understood that James did not teach the same thing as Paul. And this is why he said that epistle should be burned. He chose Paul over James. Now there are Christians as well who understand that Paul teaches something very different than the other apostles and even Yeshua himself. These Christians are known as dispensationalists. They recognize, they understand that Paul is teaching something new and something very different from that of Yeshua and the other apostles, but they rationalize and justify the teachings of Paul uh, in the form of a doctrine and theology known as dispensationalism. Now, the idea here is that there are different ages, different stages in our history, and we enter into new covenants. It is God's way of drawing us closer to Him. And according to dispensationalists, we entered into a, a, a new period or a new age with the birth of the church. And prior to that, we had the teachings of Yeshua and the apostles, but those teachings were for the Jews only. Dispensationalists actually make this claim that the teachings of Yeshua were never meant for the Gentile, were never meant for uh, pagans that the teachings of Yeshua and his entire ministry was for the Jews only, and so too were the teachings of the apostles. And so dispensationalists separate the teachings of Paul from that of the other apostles and Yeshua. So this, it, it actually, it, it amazes me. I, I can't imagine the thinking behind this, because they see, they recognize that Paul is teaching something very different. But rather than call him a false apostle, they say, hey, this was God at work here. God picked Paul to actually build the church. That the church is really built on the teachings and the revelations of Paul rather than the teachings and the revelations and the instructions and commands of Yeshua and the teachings of the other apostles. It blows my mind that Christians will go so far as to rationalize and justify the teachings of a false apostle. Now, then it is very clear to some Christians that there, there is a different gospel being taught by Paul than what Yeshua taught. They understand this, and yet they love the world so much, they love their sin so much, that they are willing to accept this false apostle even though they see his teachings as being something new and something different from Yeshua. They so love their sin that they accept the lies of Paul over the truth of Yeshua and the true apostles. This is why I say there actually are two different Christs with two different Gospels and two different paths to salvation being taught in Scripture. Yeshua and the true apostles 
are teaching the true gospel and the, the true path to the kingdom of God. The narrow, difficult path that Christ lit up, showing us that he is the path, that what he taught, his teachings and his commandments are living waters that we need to drink of. But Paul teaches something very different. Paul tries to drown us with his lies. The, the words and the teachings that come from the mouth are, of Paul are nothing but the lies of Satan. Satan is using Paul as an instrument to spread his lies. And so we do see a very different gospel and a different path being taught by Paul. Paul tells us the law is torn down. He, in fact, tore the law down and that it would be a mistake to rebuild it. Paul tells us that it is by faith alone. Paul talks about original sin and total depravity, which Yeshua and the other apostles never taught. These are all new teachings by Paul, supposedly new revelations given to Paul by Christ. Well, these are false teachings, and it is a different gospel. Two very different messiahs are taught in the Bible. One is the true messiah, the other is an imitation. So we have the true messiah and an imitation messiah being taught. And you must decide who it is you are going to follow. Are you going to follow the voice of the good shepherd or the voice of the evil shepherd? Are you going to follow the shepherd that teaches that we must stop sinning, must not sin, must subdue sin, must follow the commandments and teachings of Yeshua? Or are you going to believe the teachings of the imitation Christ that tells us the law is done away with? that you cannot out -sin God's grace, that once you confess Christ as your Lord, you are saved from that point on, that judgment day is done away with for you, that once you confess Christ as your Lord, you automatically receive the Holy Spirit, even though we find in the book of Acts the story of Simon the magician being told he could not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And even though those Christians had been baptized by Philip, they had been water baptized, and yet they had still not received the Holy Spirit. Well, this shows that just because you confess Christ as your Lord, you do not automatically receive the Holy Spirit. This is a very different Christ and a different path, supposedly to salvation being taught, a different gospel being taught by Apostle Paul, and you need to recognize the two different gospels that are being taught. One Messiah, one Christ tells us, that salvation is by faith and works. The true apostles tell us salvation is by faith and works. It is not by faith alone. So are you going to believe them or are you going to believe Paul when he tells us the law is done away with and that you cannot out -sin God's grace, that it's by faith, salvation is by faith alone? You must choose. Choose who you will serve, which Messiah, because there are two very clearly different Messiahs being taught in Scripture.
Satan has convinced many Christians that they should not read books that fall outside of the 66 books that make up the Protestant Bible. Within Protestantism, this is known as Sola Scriptura. But worse than that, there are many Christians who have been deceived into believing that they should really be focusing on the 13 epistles of the 13th apostle. So these Paulinists will focus on the 13th apostles, 13 epistles that are found within the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. But I tell you, this is a lie of Satan. Satan has worked very hard to eliminate as much of God's written word as what he can. And the reason is, it's because these other writings shed light on the false teachings of Paul. And Paul is an apostle of Satan. Now, I say this, and I use this term, apostle of Satan, because Satan himself talks about sending his apostles. We find this in Clementine's homilies. For Peter tells us that during the 40 days that Yeshua was in the desert, and during that period when he was tempted by Satan, Satan actually tells Christ that he is going to be sending his apostles. So we do have apostles of Satan. We are given this warning by Satan himself. And certainly, I don't think many people would argue that Simon the Magician was one such apostle. Unfortunately, Christians, or most Christians, fail to understand that Paul is also one of Satan's apostles. Now, I'd like to speak a little bit to uh, the uh, Damascus document, which is one of the writings that are part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the reason is, is because it talks about false teachers. In fact, it, it prophesies about one false teacher known as the Man of Mockery. The man of mockery is described as someone who tries to drown Israel with lies that spew from his mouth. I actually, I want to correct myself. It doesn't describe it as trying to drown Israel, but it talks about the man of mockery spewing lies onto Israel. Well, we also find a similar description given to us in the book of Revelation, for it talks about the dragon trying to drown a woman. And the woman, of course, is the bride of Christ. It is the church. And we have this illustration of the dragon trying to drown the woman with the waters that come from his mouth. Well, the waters coming from the mouth of the dragon are his lies. It's the lies of Satan. So Satan is trying to destroy the church with the lies that come from his mouth. And it's, or I should say, we are given this illustration of water being the lies that come from the mouth of the dragon. But it's important to understand the time period that Satan is uh, held back, that his lies can't drown the woman. For we are told that the woman is protected for a time period of a time, times and a half a time. Well, one time is one year, but it's not your typical one year period. Rather, it's talking about a jubilee year, and a jubilee year is a 50 year cycle. So a time is 50 years times is two jubilee years, which is a hundred years, and then a half a time being 25 years for a total of 175 years. And if we add that to, or if we be begin that 175 years from the point of the beginning of the birth of the church, that brings us to approximately 205 AD. And coincidentally, this is really when the canon process began. And it's at that point, that Satan began to work very hard to eliminate as much of God's written word as what he could. And he's been doing it ever since, eliminating more and more of God's written word. Uh, until recently, we came up with the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. And I say recently because I'm going to share with you this Bible here. This is a Protestant King James Bible. It's 130 years old and it contains the 14 books of the Apocrypha. It includes the 14 books of the Apocrypha, so it's more than just 66 books. This is why I say it's really only recently that we've reduced God's written word down to 66 books. Now, I'd like to go back to the Damascus document again, for it goes into uh, more detail about false teachers. It tells us that the religious leaders of the day, who were the Pharisees and Sadducees, 
they would look for gaps in the law. This is how the Essenes who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls describe it. They describe the religious leaders as looking for gaps in the law. Well, another word for gaps is loopholes. That's how we would describe it today, that the religious leaders look for loopholes in the law. And Yeshua confronted the Pharisees and Sadducees regarding this as well. Yeshua tells us that we are supposed to live more righteous lives than the Pharisees and Sadducees. He talks about the yeast of the Pharisees. He talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees being hypocrites. And the reason he tells us is because they focus on those parts of the law that benefit them while they let other parts of the law slide. So when it benefits them, they focus on and they force the people to adhere to certain parts of the law. But other parts of the law, no problem. We'll let those parts slide. Yeshua, taught, he gives us a good example of this regarding getting or helping an animal out of a well when it comes to the Sabbath. The, we find the Pharisees confronting Yeshua regarding the Sabbath. And Yeshua says, hey, you have no problem getting one of your animals out of the well on the Sabbath. Well, you wouldn't know it just from the, uh, the writings of the Bible. But the Essenes believed that on the Sabbath, you were not supposed to help an animal out of the well if it fell into it. This was a law of the Sabbath. So Yeshua was actually referring to the Damascus document, or at least to the teachings of the Essenes when it came to the Sabbath. And he's basically saying, hey, you look for gaps in the law in that you would help an animal, one of your animals, out of a well on the Sabbath. Well, this shows that Yeshua is referring to writings that fall outside of the Bible. And the Damascus document is one such document that we can see Yeshua referring to, or at least the teachings of the Essenes. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Paul goes one huge step further than simply looking for gaps in the law. The Pharisees and Sadducees during the time of Yeshua looked for gaps in the law, but Paul goes further in actually doing away with the law, tearing the law down, for this is how Paul describes it. He tore down the law. Paul did away with the law completely, so how much worse is that than what the Pharisees were doing who simply looked for gaps and loopholes in the law. I tell you, Paul is by far worse than the Pharisees who confronted Yeshua. Paul coming after Yeshua and doing away with the law proves that he is actually an apostle of Satan. One of the very apostles that Satan warned that he would be sending. Scripture is very clear that we are to test the fruit of anyone claiming to be a child of God, that being anyone professing Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we are to test the fruit of people who are professing Christ, who claim to be a brother or sister in Christ. And we do this for a number of reasons. One, we do it for the protection of our very own soul because we want to ensure that we are following a, a true pastor, someone who has really been given divine inspiration to lead the church. And if they have not been given divine inspiration, if they are not guided by the Holy Spirit, then they do not hold the keys to the kingdom, even though they may think they do, and they will not enter the kingdom of God. They will enter the wide gate to hell, and they will take anyone who is believing their teachings with them. So, simply for our own good, we need to test the fruit of people claiming to be a child of God. But we also do it for the bride of Christ. We do it in an effort to keep the bride pure. And so we are to test those people claiming to be a child of God, claiming to be a Christian. And if they are living contrary to the teachings of Christ and the apostles, then we need to rebuke them, refute them, and reprove them. And then if they will not change their ways, then we need to walk away from them. We stop fellowshipping with them. This is according to Scripture. Now, when it comes to Paul, I've already talked about his teachings being contrary to that of Yeshua and the other apostles. But what I'd like to now do is look at his lifestyle, look at 
the things that he actually did. Look at his actions and his works. Now, I'd like to remind you that it's not enough to talk the talk. It's not enough to talk about love and faith, to talk about the kingdom of God and God and how much someone loves God and loves people in general. It's not enough to, to have lip service. You must be able to walk the walk. And when we actually look at Paul, what we see is, is that he doesn't walk the walk. For example, when it came to uh, traveling with Mark, Paul proved that he had a hardness of heart and unforgiveness, that he talks a lot about forgiveness and love, but when it came to Mark, he hung on to a grudge. He felt slighted by Mark on a previous occasion when they were together, and they ended up going separate ways. So because Mark felt he had to travel a different route and wasn't going to go with Paul, Paul hung on to this grudge. And the next time they met, Paul refused to let Mark travel with him, even though Mark and Barnabas wanted to. And so this goes to show that Paul really didn't have the love and the forgiveness in his heart and mercy that he claimed to have. He talked the talk, but he didn't walk the walk. And we, we need to keep in mind that we don't know why Mark did what he did. We have no idea. It's very possible that Mark, who was an apostle himself, who wrote one of the four Gospels, it's very possible that he felt guided by God to go the route that he did. He felt guided, possibly by God, having received a word from God, to go the route that he, that he ended up uh, going. And so... Paul's actions show rotten fruit, but that's not the only instance. What we find when we actually take the time to read the scriptures and go outside of the Bible, it becomes obvious that Paul had a passive-aggressive personality and that he was very envious of the other apostles. He was very envious, and what he did is, in order to build himself up, Paul tried to tear the other apostles down. This is how he made himself look good, by tearing down the other apostles. A good example of this has to do with his account of things that took place in Antioch. He talks about this in uh, Galatians. He tells us, according to his account, he confronted Peter and called Peter a hypocrite. And he, he writes about this to one of the major churches. And so it wasn't enough. I mean, even if the story were true, and he did confront Peter. It's not the kind of thing that he should have been writing about to the church for anyone and everyone to read and to hear about. That's something that should have been kept between Paul and Peter. But there's more to this story. And you would know this if you were to read Clementine's homilies. For we know that Paul claims that we are no longer under the law. Peter and James, however, felt very differently. Peter understood, as did James, that they were still under the law and they lived accordingly. Now, that doesn't mean that Peter would no longer eat with Gentiles. However, Peter would not eat with Gentiles who had not been water baptized. For your average Gentile, your average pagan was still considered unclean and Peter would not eat with them. He would only eat with someone, with a Gentile, who was now considered clean, having been uh, water baptized. And this is explained in Clementine's homilies. We learn this in, in the, uh, the part where it tells about Clementine and uh, his brothers finally finding their mother. Now, they had been separated from their mother for a number of years, and in fact, their mother believed that two of her sons had been killed in a shipwreck. And so they hadn't seen each other for a good number of years. And then their mother finds the, her three sons uh, following and fellowshipping with Peter. And so they're all overjoyed at finding one another. But Peter refused to let her eat with her sons until she had been water baptized. It didn't matter that she confessed Christ as her Lord, which she did. She she said that she was a believer. She did believe and wanted to be a Christian. But Peter refused to let her eat with her sons until she actually was water baptized. And he wouldn't simply water baptize her because or he wouldn't simply baptize her because she wanted to be baptized. He made her fast for a day before he would baptize her. 
and only then could she eat with her sons. Well, knowing this then, it's understandable why Peter would eat with some Gentiles in Antioch, but wouldn't eat with others. Whereas Paul, because he didn't think he was under the law, would eat with anyone and everyone. Paul tells us this. He doesn't have a problem with any kind of food, even if it's being sacrificed to idols. Peter, on the other hand, does have a problem. And so he wasn't being a hypocrite in Antioch. Rather, he simply refused to eat with those believers who had not yet been water baptized. This is the true story of what happened in Antioch. But because we have only the one account, and because there is no second witness to what actually happened, you can't possibly really know what happened unless you read outside of the Bible. Now, regarding food, when Paul talks about food and how there's really no benefit to any particular diet, this is really a shot at both James and Peter. I say this because both James and Peter were staunch vegetarians. And again, you don't find this in the Bible. You do find it, however, uh, in one place, Clementine's homilies, and the other in the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus. I say this because Peter tells us in the homilies that he is a vegetarian, that he lives on a, a staple of bread and olives, and only occasionally does he eat other fruits and vegetables, but he will eat no meat. James is the same way. Josephus tells us this. He tells us James would eat no meat, and more than that, he, would, he lived a life of poverty. James rejected wealth of any kind, as did Peter. Peter talks about his frugal living, how he only owns one coat. You know, Peter and James both choose a life of poverty, and they both live uh, on a diet as a vegetarian, refusing to eat meat. And so this is why Paul talks so much about food. He's really taking a shot at the the, pop, the apostles who hid the church. He is claiming to have superior knowledge when it comes to food. And he talks about those people who don't have this superior knowledge as having weak consciences. Well, this is Paul taking a shot at James and Peter. And he does the same thing when it comes to marriage. For we find Paul tells us that because he is not married, he is able to give his all to God. He does not have to divide his attention and energy between God and a spouse. And he talks about this in the very same letter that he also talks about both James and Peter being married. For he talks about the fact that when these people, when these apostles come with their spouse, you have no problem uh, putting them up and feeding them. But me, I don't uh, put you out like they do. I don't ask you to take care of me, but here you are taking care of them and their spouse. Well, there wouldn't have been too much uh, really to take care of when it came to Peter. He only needed some bread and olives. So there really wasn't that much involved in taking care of Peter when he visited. Paul, on the, on the other hand, well, he eats anything and everything. Now, Paul, he, he brings up the fact that they're married, and he also talks about, in the same letter, the fact that anyone who is married, well, they're inferior to him because he is able to give everything to God, whereas they can't. And once again, I'd like to mention that Paul talks about working harder than all of the other apostles. Paul, according to himself, works harder than any of the other apostles. So this is Paul building himself up by tearing the other apostles down. It should be obvious by now that there are many contradictions between Paul, Yeshua, and the true apostles. There should be no doubt now that there are these contradictions. The question is, how are you going to rationalize and justify it? Are you going to be like the dispensationalist and say, yes, there are contradictions, but it's because we entered into a new age and Yeshua appointed Paul as the one who would head the church and give us this new information and revelation regarding the law and regarding salvation and the work that was done on the cross? Or 
will you recognize that Paul is teaching something very different. And because he is teaching something different, it shows him to be a false apostle. You have to make that decision. Now, while I have shown you a good number of these contradictions, there's one that I would like to speak specifically to. I'd like to uh, spend a bit more time on it, and that has to do with food that has been sacrificed to idols. For Paul teaches something very different from what the other apostles taught in Yeshua. We find in the book of Acts that Peter and the other apostles, the leaders of the church, make it very clear in their letter to the church in Antioch, uh, and it's the letter that Paul was given, that we are not supposed to eat food sacrificed to idols. No questions about it. No exceptions given. Do not eat food sacrificed to idols. Then we find in the book of Revelation, Yeshua gives a letter to the church in Thyatira, and he addresses this matter. And he condemns people from that church who have been eating food sacrificed to idols. And the term that he puts to it or gives it is that these people believe they have deeper truths that allow them to have uh, or to live sexually immoral lives and to eat food sacrificed to idols. They believe in these deeper truths. While well, Paul talks about having superior knowledge when it comes to food sacrificed to idols in 1 Corinthians. So it really is Yeshua addressing this idea of having superior knowledge or deeper truths when it comes to food sacrificed to idols. And it's very clear that Yeshua condemns people who are doing this. It doesn't matter what excuse Paul gives. It doesn't matter his reasoning for it. We are not to eat food sacrificed to idols, but according to Paul, you can. You only need to read verse 10 in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, and you will see that Paul is talking about believers being in the temple, eating food sacrificed to idols. And he says, if you observe such a person who has superior knowledge. So he's describing someone eating food in the temple, and this is a believer, and he does not condemn the person for doing it. He only has a problem with it if someone else, another believer, who doesn't have this superior knowledge, if they should see you, then their conscience is going to be offended, and they may stumble. Well, this is contrary. It's completely contrary. I can't stress it enough to what Yeshua and the other apostles taught. Peter explains it in Clementine's homilies that when we eat food sacrificed to idols, we are in fact sitting down and eating with demons. And this is why we must not do it. If you eat food sacrificed to idols, you are sitting down and sharing a meal with demons. Now, going back to the church in Thyatira, what we see here is another red flag. Yeshua is pointing out that this teaching comes from Paul. Now you ask, why is this? Well, it's because of the, the mentioning, I'm sorry, the mentioning of the prophetess from Thyatira. Yeshua is pointing to a woman from Thyatira who heads this church and is teaching people sexual immorality and this idea that they can eat food sacrificed to idols. Well, I've already established that Paul taught this same thing. But what you may not be aware is that in the book of Acts, we are told that Paul baptized a woman from Thyatira, a rich merchant woman from Thyatira. This is the first person that we hear of Paul baptizing in Asia Minor. And it's a woman from Thyatira. And then what we find is approximately 30 to 40 years after Paul's death, for this is when the book of Revelation was written, we find Yeshua condemning a woman from Thyatira for teaching the very same things that Paul did. So this is a connection that Yeshua is pointing out to us. We find this connection, another red flag, another signpost in Scripture pointing to Paul being a false apostle. He taught this woman from Thyatira, and Yeshua condemned that woman for her teachings. 
Sticking with the letter that Yeshua wrote to the church in Thyatira, I'd like to address that part of the letter that speaks to sexual immorality. For this too is written due to the teachings of Paul. Paul taught sexual immorality by way of divorce and remarriage. I say this because Paul taught that if you were a believer who were married to an unbeliever and that unbeliever left you, then according to Paul, you are no longer legally bound to that person. Well, no longer legally bound means you can then legally remarry. This is what Paul taught. But Yeshua never taught such an exception. There was no exception to his law to his rules and commandments regarding divorce and remarriage. According to Yeshua, there are no exceptions. You cannot divorce and then remarry. You are bound to your spouse for life. The only way you can legally remarry is if your spouse dies. If you divorce them, then you simply remain unmarried. You do not divorce and remarry, no exceptions, to the rule according to Yeshua. But then Paul comes along and says, hey, there is now a new exception to this rule because we're talking about believers and unbelievers. Now, it's great if you are married to an unbeliever that you stay together. You do everything in your power to remain together. However, if your unbelieving spouse leaves you, then you are no longer legally bound to that person. Well, this is what Yeshua is referring to when he writes the church in Thyatira. At least it is one of the sexual immorality issues. Yes, there may have been others as well, but make no mistake about it, Paul's teaching regarding divorce and remarriage, telling us that we can legally remarry if an unbeliever spouse leaves us. This is a lie. It was only taught by Paul and no one else, and it's why Yeshua is addressing the issue to the church in Thyatira. So these are two teachings that Yeshua addresses regarding the prophetess in Thyatira, this woman from Thyatira. And I tell you, it's the same woman. The reason it is even mentioned is so that we can see the connection between Paul and this prophetess, for Paul baptized a woman from Thyatira. And think about the number of times that it's mentioned in Scripture of Paul baptizing someone. Think about the, the very few people that we are told he baptizes, and one of them is this woman from Thyatira. And then we find a prophetess from Thyatira being condemned for teaching the very same kinds of things that Paul taught. This is Yeshua showing us without question that Paul is a false apostle, but Christians today don't want to recognize it. Even when I point it out to them, they want to ignore the evidence. But Paul introduced a new rule regarding divorce and remarriage. And it's a rule that was never taught by anyone else. And since then, uh, people, the, the church rather, has even extended that line in the sand. They keep drawing a new line, taking it back further and further until today was being taught in the church as well. You can't out sin God's grace and you are no longer bound to the law. That means you can divorce and remarry as many times as you want. And so we find people in the church today living every which way as the world does, divorcing and remarrying. You know, it's all due to the teachings of Paul. The Catholic Church, for example, and the introduction of annulments, it's based on the teachings of Paul, for it certainly has nothing to do with what Yeshua taught. Yeshua taught very strict laws regarding divorce. If you divorce, then you live separate for the rest of your life. You never remarry. It's very clear. So Paul is teaching sexual immorality. He's endorsing adultery with this new rule that he introduced regarding uh, believers and unbelievers. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that it's not possible to confess Christ as your Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So, according to Paul, 
If someone is confessing Christ as their Lord, it is because they've had the revelation of who Christ is and they have the Holy Spirit in them. This is the only possible way anyone can confess Christ as their Lord. Well, the problem with this is that we know this is not true. It's obvious that this is an outright lie. Now, when it comes to Christians who want to believe this, what they will do is twist the meaning of what Paul is saying. They understand that there are many Christians who confess Christ as their Lord. And so this passage can't possibly mean what it's saying. And so they, they twist the words of Paul. What they end up doing is believing, or rather, I'm sorry, they end up reading what they believe instead of simply believing what they read. Because if they believe what they read, they would understand that this is showing Paul to be a false apostle. Now then, there are other Christians who accept this at face value. They understand that this is what Paul is saying. And of course, according to them, Paul is a true apostle. And if he says it, it must be true. It must be factual. And so there are those Christians who accept this passage at face value and they have created doctrine and theology around this passage. It's called easy believism. Others will call it once saved, always saved, and by faith alone. There are those Christians who honestly believe that if they are on the street corner preaching uh, to people, and after spending 15 minutes with them, if they can convince them to say a sinner's prayer and confess Christ as their Lord, well, from that point on, that person is saved. They cannot possibly lose their salvation. And the reason is because they believe this passage from Paul, that you can't confess Christ as your Lord unless you have the Holy Spirit in you. So according to these people, anyone, confessing Christ as their Lord on the street corner after a 15-minute teaching on Christ, well, then that person is guaranteed their salvation. The Holy Spirit will never leave them. They can never lose their salvation. Judgment Day is suspended for these people. Well, the problem with this is that it's an outright lie. We know it simply from Scripture. If people would actually read Scripture, they would see that this proves, or that Scripture proves Paul to be a liar. Yeshua tells us this himself when he talks about those people, those believers who confess him as their Lord and they perform miracles in his name. And yet he tells them, get away from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And what does worker of iniquity mean if not being a sinner? This is what Yeshua is saying. He tells us there will be emphatic believers, people who will call him Lord, Lord. And that's what it means when the, the word Lord is repeated twice. It's like underlining it. It's putting it in capital letters. It's highlighting it, that these are emphatic believers. And yet Yeshua will say, get away from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. This then is proof that people can confess Christ as their Lord and not have the Holy Spirit in them. For if they ever, even at one point, had the Holy Spirit in them, Yeshua could not possibly say, I never knew you. The reason is, the gift of the Holy Spirit is from God. And Yeshua is the Son of God, and He is God Himself. He is one-third of the Holy Trinity. So if someone, even for a moment, had the Holy Spirit in them, at least for that moment, Yeshua would have known them. But He says, get away from me, I never knew you. It's obvious then that people can confess Christ as their Lord and not have the Holy Spirit in them. And this is expanded upon in Clementine's homilies. Peter talks about a specific instance when Yeshua is talking to one of his followers and says, hey, why do you call me Lord and not do as I command you? That you confess me as your Lord, but you don't do what I instruct you to do? Well, this is Peter explaining to us that people can confess him as their Lord and not have the Holy Spirit in them. Then we have this story in the book of Acts regarding believers in Samaria. We find in this story that the apostle Philip goes into Samaria and he's preaching and teaching there and many people become believers and become water baptized. And then Philip goes on his way, he leaves. Uh, sometime later, Peter comes into Samaria and he finds all of these believers who had been water baptized and yet had not received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were believers, 
true believers confessing Christ as their Lord. They had been water baptized and yet did not have the Holy Spirit. So this proves people can confess Christ as their Lord and not have the Holy Spirit. That they don't even have the Holy Spirit in them to give them the revelation of who Christ is. They've confessed him as their Lord without having the Holy Spirit in them. And then we find that Peter lays his hands on these believers, many of them, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there's one person, Simon the Magician, who asks to buy this gift from Peter, and Peter condemns him and says, hey, forget it. You are wicked, you are evil. I am not laying my hands on you. And so we find here that Peter actually denies the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter is able to hold back the gift so that someone does not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, even though that person had been water baptized and had confessed Christ as his Lord. So this idea that you automatically receive the gift of the Holy Spirit or that you can't confess Christ as your Lord unless you have the Holy Spirit, well, it's a lie. It's an obvious lie that is shown to be a lie in Scripture. So my brothers and sisters, how is it that you believe Paul can be a true apostle if he's told such a, a grievous lie. And this is a very serious lie that has resulted in many false doctrines and teachings. That it, it's resulted in the growth of the apostate church. Anyone believing in teaching easy believism, it is because of the teachings of Paul. The strongest argument for Paul and the one passage that his supporters will inevitably bring up is found in 2 Peter. It's a very short passage where, according to the supporters of Paul, Peter is declaring Paul a brother and more than that, declares his writings, his letters as scripture. And that's enough for the supporters of Paul. But can we trust this very short passage or is it possible that a scribe has inserted this passage? I believe that that really is the case, and I'll be explaining why in a moment. But before I get into my argument, I'd like to share with you a short video clip of a Christian YouTuber by the name of Tecton TV. Now, Tecton is a staunch supporter of Paul. He believes without question, without doubt, that Paul is a true apostle. He also believes that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. But what you will find in the clip that I'm going to share with you. And actually, one more point I'd like to bring up is he considers himself a Bible scholar. And he has followers who believe that he's a Bible scholar. So this is somebody that we should be able to trust. This is somebody in the know who really understands the Bible. Well, what you will find in the clip that I'm sharing with you is when it's convenient for Tecton, he argues that not every time we find the word scripture in the Bible is it actually referring to the inspired word of God. Sometimes, according to this Bible scholar, when we find the word scripture, it's actually only simply referring to writings. Just writings in general. It could be referring to any writing, but it does not always refer to the inspired word of God. So please take a moment watch his clip or watch the clip from his video and then uh, I'll come back and share my thoughts. So let's close with one final question. In John 7:38, what document is Jesus referring to? None. You're sure? Yes, Dr. Martzer? Actually, it's not an exact quote. It's an allusion to a saying in the book of Sirach, chapter 24, verses 30 through 32. Wait a minute here. Jesus says his scripture says that. What are you, a Catholic? No, but the word you simply means any written document. It doesn't apply exclusively to the Old Testament. Now, I'd like to be very clear here. When I read the word scripture in the Bible or in non-canonical writings, I believe it's speaking about the inspired word of God. So I believe it means uh, scripture as in the sense most people think of the word scripture. 
My point for sharing this video clip with you is that there are those Bible scholars, at least people who consider themselves Bible scholars, that believe sometimes when we read the word scripture, it's not really speaking about the inspired word of God. It's not speaking about inspired writings, but rather writings in general. And if you are such a Christian, if you have ever argued this point, then you cannot argue with any certainty that Peter is actually referring to Paul's writings as being inspired. Rather, he's simply referring to them as writings. Now, I'd also like to make it clear here that I believe 2 Peter was in fact written by the Apostle Peter. However, when it comes to the passage that speaks to Apostle Paul, well, that's a different story. That short passage of one and a half verses was added by a scribe at some point in time to add credence and greater weight to the writings of Paul. And as evidence that this kind of thing was going on and could easily have been done, I'd like to refer you to a writing of Peter's that didn't make it into the canon. It's a writing that is, though, important in understanding how his writings were being corrupted. For Peter, explains to James that even while he was still alive, there were those people who were twisting and corrupting his teachings and writings. And for this reason, he gave instructions to James that his letters, meaning Peter's letters, should not be given to anyone and everyone, that his writings and teachings weren't for the general public, but rather for the initiate. And in fact, he goes so far as to say his letters were not to be given to people until they had proven themselves over a number of years and then only show them, only share with them one or two of his letters. And only after they prove themselves, after reading some of his letters, should they be given more. Well, this lines up with Second Esther's, which talks about 70 books that were for the initiate only, while 24 were for the general public. 24 books for anyone and everyone, but 70 that were for the initiate only. And what we see is that Peter is continuing with that kind of teaching. He understood that his teachings would be corrupted. And I believe that's what we see happening in his letter, in this second epistle. Somebody, at some point in time, corrupted his writings by adding this short passage. Now, as other evidence of this, I'm going to read the passage with the part about Paul in it, and then I'm going to read it taking out that short one and a half uh, verse passage. So first, with Paul's passage in it, beginning in verse 14. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. Some of his comments are hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. And now I'm going to read that same passage, but I'm going to leave out the part about Paul and skip to verse 17. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. I am warning you ahead of time, dear friends. Be on guard so that you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Do you see how it flows there? You can take out the part about Paul and the passage flows equally well. This shows then that at least it's a possibility that this passage was inserted because you could insert it and not even change the flow of the passage. Now regarding the fact that Peter refers to Paul as a brother. This too is a sign that it wasn't written by Peter. Because if Peter really was referring to someone that has written the inspired word of God, has written what we would consider scripture, do you really think he would just refer to him as a brother? For anyone that would be part of the congregation, all followers would be considered a brother. However, brothers 
would not, or the term brother would not be referred to as someone who has written the inspired word of God. Rather, you would give them uh, a higher title than that, greater acknowledgement. You would, for example, call them a prophet or an apostle. So the fact that Peter is referring to Paul merely as a brother is actually an insult because we find earlier in his letter here that he refers to apostles. So he's already spoken about apostles, but when it comes to Paul, he only calls him a brother. So this really would be a slight, and there's no way he would call someone a brother who has written the inspired word of God. Then what about the fact that Peter says his writings are difficult, that people confuse his writings? Well, I ask you, is God our Father a God of confusion? I tell you, he's not. And there's no way if somebody was inspired by God and if they were writing uh, the inspired word of God that it would sound confusing. That simply is not the way of God. So the mere fact that his writings are being called confusing and difficult to understand, well, that goes to show that it's not the inspired word of God. And what about the fact that Peter is actually calling the writings of Paul scripture while Paul is still alive. I ask you, is there any precedence for this in scripture? I tell you, there isn't. So this idea of Peter calling Paul's writings scripture, calling them the inspired word of God, prior to any council being convened, I tell you, it would not have happened. So there's no way, no way whatsoever, that Peter would ever have called Paul's writings, the inspired word of God, and called them scripture without having convened a council to determine it. Because they had gone 400 years, 400 years which are known as the silent years, where there were no prophets, no writings. And yet we're to believe that Paul comes along, writes a few letters, and Peter refers to his writings as scripture. Well, I tell you, this would be a huge thing, monumental, that we have someone new for the first time in over 400 years writing the word of God. That would have been so huge, you would hear other apostles and other prophets writing about it. It wouldn't simply be one and a half verses slipped in in Second Peter. We would have been hearing a whole lot more about Paul's uh, wondrous writings by the other apostles if in fact it had been declared that his writings were scripture. So this identifies, it shows really that there should be no question that this passage had been slipped in by a scribe at some point in time. It should be apparent to all by now that Paul's gospel contradicts the gospel of Yeshua and the other apostles. But more than that, there are times when Paul actually contradicts himself. And this is nowhere more apparent than on his teaching regarding sin and the treatment of women. For when it comes to sin and salvation and uh, the work of Christ on the cross, when it comes to these things, according to Paul, according to the historical facts that he lays out, sin entered the world through Adam. But then when it comes to another topic, when it comes to the treatment of women and the role that they can play in the church, well, then no, sin didn't enter the world through Adam, but rather it entered through Eve. And because sin entered the world through a woman, because it is a woman that was deceived by Satan, well, women are to remain subservient to men and they must remain silent in the church. Now, in his teachings regarding women, Paul, on one occasion, talks about the law, and then in another place, he talks about tradition, and the fact that it's always been a particular way, and it should remain that way. So, according to Paul, men are no longer under uh, the law. They don't have to be circumcised, and so on. But when it comes to women, they are to remain under the law, and worse, remain true to tradition. So this shows Paul to contradict himself, and it shows that he is very biased when it comes to women. And he changes the historical facts when it comes to uh, one particular teaching. And it just goes to show that 
Paul did not receive his revelation and understanding from Yeshua, but rather from an imitation Christ. And I say this because Yeshua himself teaches against what Paul is saying regarding women. For we find in the gospel according to Thomas, and I need to make this clear for some Christians, because some people get uh, two different gospels mixed up. I'm not talking about the gospel of Thomas, but rather the gospel according to Thomas. Two very different writings. The gospel according to Thomas is filled with teachings and sayings of Christ. And what he tells us in this gospel is that he was going to make women as men. That women, in other words, were going to be equal to men, no longer subservient to them. And so his teaching regarding women contradicts that of Paul. And Paul would have known this if he'd actually been taught by the true Messiah. But instead, he was taught by an imitation Christ. And this is why he remains biased towards women. For Satan hates women. Satan is a hater of women. And we see Paul also treating women very differently than men trying to keep them subservient, trying to keep them silent in the church. Going so far as to say, if a woman has a question, they aren't supposed to ask it in the church, but rather wait until they get home and ask their spouse. Well, what happens when that spouse doesn't really have an interest in what is being said in the church? What happens when that spouse simply has a, a poor understanding of what is being taught, a poor understanding of salvation and of Christ. Well, his interpretation of what is said is going to poorly reflect the true gospel. And so he's going to teach his spouse and his children something very different, perhaps, of what was actually being taught. But the woman has no choice but to follow the teachings of her spouse because she could not ask questions to the teacher directly. She couldn't actually ask the pastor, the teacher, or the preacher directly herself. She had to wait till she gets home. She had to remain silent. Even though Yeshua talks about men and women prophesying in the future, women, according to Paul, are still supposed to remain silent. Well, it just goes once again to show Paul to be a false apostle. We find in the Old Testament writing known as Zechariah a prophecy about God making a new covenant with all nations. Well, there is only one such covenant, and that is the new covenant that we are living under today, the New Testament age. This is what is spoken about in the prophecy found in Zechariah, a new covenant, and it's what we are living under today. And that might sound good if you've never actually read this passage. Unfortunately, it's not good because what we are told is that God will break that covenant. God will break the new covenant that is made with all nations. Now this flies in the face of what many people believe and teach. For there are many Christians who teach that God cannot break his covenant. We can. We can turn our backs on God, but God can never turn his back on us. God can never be the one to break the covenant. Well, that's a lie, because it clearly tells us in Zechariah that God will break this new covenant, which is the New Testament age that we are living in. And I tell you, the reason he breaks it is because of the condition that he finds the bride of Christ in. For when we become born again, we are given robes of righteousness. And these robes of righteousness are a gift that we are expected to treat properly. And if come judgment day, we are found to be wearing robes of righteousness that are tattered and torn and muddied while we will pay a very dear price for it. You will be found guilty and you will be punished beyond anything that you can imagine. You better return the robe of righteousness in the same condition that it's given you. You better take heed of this warning in Zechariah that God will break his covenant with the Bride of Christ, this new covenant that we are living under. Now, something that speaks more to this is found in the book of Revelation, and it has to do with what the two witnesses are going to be wearing, for we are told they will be wearing burlap. 
And the reason someone wears burlap is because they are in deep sorrow and mourning. And so the two witnesses will be in deep sorrow and mourning over the condition of the bride of Christ. These two witnesses are going to have a dual purpose. One is to be a witness for Christ, but the other is to be a witness against this evil, wicked generation. And I tell you, it, it will be because of the apostate church. They will be in deep sorrow and mourning because God breaks his covenant with the bride of Christ. So many Christians don't want to believe this, but it's there. It's very clear in Scripture. So this idea of once saved, always saved, that you can't lose your salvation, that you can't out sin God's grace, well, it's very clear in Scripture that you can out sin God's grace, and most have. Now, I'd like to end just having a short discussion on who is going to be found uh, more wanting and more guilty, if you will, or who is going to be held more accountable if they are deceived by the false apostle Paul. Will it be the person who actually lived during the time period of Paul and heard his words personally, or will we be held to a greater accountability? Will we suffer greater punishment if we are the ones to fall victim to Paul's lies? Now, I know one argument can be made that while there are so many different denominations, it's hard to tell what is the truth, who is teaching the truth. But I tell you, it would have been far more difficult during the time of Paul, because there would have been many people who would have only heard the teachings of Paul. He would have been the only one that they heard from. So they would have only heard the imitation Christ being taught by Paul. They would have only heard the false gospel of Paul's. However, today we don't have the luxury of that excuse. We have 13 letters from Paul. And so we are able to compare them and see the contradictions among his own writings. Whereas those people who lived during the time period of Paul, well, the chances are many of them would not have even been able to read his letters because they could not read themselves, even if they had the letter in their hands. And then for others, they would have only been able to hear or read the letter that was sent to their particular church for it would have taken years and decades for Paul's letters to circulate. And so they didn't have the benefit of being able to compare Paul's letters from one church to another. We, however, have that benefit. And then there's the fact that we can also compare Paul's letters to that of the other apostles and to that of Yeshua's teachings found by way of the Gospels. So we have many benefits that those people who heard from Paul personally didn't have. And so we have no excuse. There is no excuse for falling victim to the lies of Paul when we can compare his teachings to that of the true apostles and Yeshua. And we don't just have what we find in the Bible. As I've tried to stress, there are many other writings. Clementine's homilies, uh, the uh, Shepherd of Hermas. These are two very important writings that if you were to read them, you would see very clearly that the road to salvation that's taught in these writings is very different from what Paul taught. And so I would ask you to consider the information that's being presented to you and consider what I'm saying here, that you will be held accountable and you will have no excuse whatsoever for falling victim to the teachings of Paul because you can read. You can read and you can hear the differences and see the differences between the teachings of Paul and the true apostles and Yeshua. So I suggest that you wake up. Wake up to the reality of the true gospel and throw away the gospel of Paul. Throw away his false teachings. For I tell you, this Roman road to salvation that so many people talk about, it is not a road to salvation, but a road to destruction. The Roman road is a path to destruction and you better learn how and where you can find the narrow path that is difficult, but that leads to the kingdom of God. All right, that's about all I have to say, except uh, I'd like to reiterate the fact that if I am in error, I truly do want to know about it, but you must do it with scripture. And so I encourage anyone to create a video response, even if you actually agree with me. I encourage people to share their gospel. And if I'm wrong, I want to know about it.
As always, I look forward to comments and messages. May you and yours be abundantly blessed.